Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. My new book, Diary of a Psychosis, is out. It's the most lively, devastating baseball bat to the throat takedown of what the public health establishment did in 2020 and beyond that you can imagine. It's my first book in nine years, and you're going to love it. Check it out at diaryofcovid.com. And if you've already bought it, make sure also to visit diaryofcovid.com so you can claim your free bonuses, including my free companion volume, Collateral Damage, a collection of stories from real people who suffered under the restrictions. They weren't allowed to tell their stories at the time, but every one of them told me, we just want to be heard. Check it all out at diaryofcovid.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to have with me Daniel Prince, who is host of the Once Bitten podcast, which has to do with Bitcoin. But we're not really going to be talking about Bitcoin today, even though I have people clamoring for another Bitcoin episode. We will get to that at some point, perhaps with Daniel. But I have something rather more urgent to discuss with him, and that is I just discovered his book, thanks to our mutual friend, the great Henry Bingaman. And that book is Choose Life, the Tools, Tricks, and Hacks of Long-Term Family Travelers, World Schoolers, and Digital Nomads. Now, I would think that my audience would be interested in, I don't know, at least two of those, uh, because it does involve uh, the, the life you've chosen, a different approach to educating kids than putting them in a classroom and regimenting them and, and barking things at them and hoping that they memorize them. Uh, this is rather a different approach, and it has me very intrigued. So, Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on, Tom. Great to connect here. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm so glad I found out about you from, from Henry. So let's talk about, and by the way, this is a book that can be consumed very quickly, but it's a book you're going to want to keep as a reference um, for a long time because it is filled with links to valuable resources that I certainly didn't know about. I mean, almost all of them were new to me. Um, that will make my life better in a variety of ways. But basically, take a minute to explain to uh, listeners what exactly it is that you and your wife decided to do, the, the break that you decided to make. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this all stemmed back to my, uh, me moaning and complaining to a friend at lunchtime uh, about like the state of life, you know, back in 2013. You know, why is it we're running a thousand miles an hour on this hamster wheel and we just, you know, come the end of the month, we're, uh, you know, we're still net zero. Why, why is that happening? Why are we all working so hard and we just can't, you know, get to, to make ends meet? And uh, surely there's another way to live life. It shouldn't be like this. And I was 18 years into a, uh, a career in foreign exchange. I worked in the financial markets. I was in Singapore at the time, and he said, go pick up a copy of The, the 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Uh, and so that's where this all began for me because I read that book. I just ripped through it, and I suddenly realized that uh, I painted myself into a corner in a career that I never even wanted to go into. Just, you know, that happened. And my wife and I uh, were living a deferred lifestyle. We had four kids at home. And I was a lodger in my own home. I would see them at the weekends if I was lucky, you know, that, that classic old story of having kids at home and your wife just too busy herself running them around, getting them from different places, different, you know, ballet lessons to swimming lessons to whatever. And we weren't living. We weren't living as a family, not the way a family should be living. Uh, so uh, after reading that book about five times in about as many months, we found the confidence to sell everything we owned, take the kids all out of school. They were in school at that point, and to start traveling because we knew we wanted to travel. And you know, we'll figure we'll we'll figure something out along the way. After nine months, I'll probably end up getting another job or something. Uh, so that's where it all began. And uh, yeah, life has never been the same again ever since. Now, obviously, people hear this and they're going to have questions like, how did you afford that? Are you some kind of multimillionaire? There's no way this could apply to me. What do you do with the kids? Um, is the truant officer chasing after them? Um, how are they being educated? I mean, there's so many things and I would like to get into as many of them as possible. I, by the way, I'm only saying parentheses. I've said on this show 
that if somebody ever wrote even a short ebook on traveling with kids, I'd love to read it. I'd love to get any tips uh, for, for long distance trips because I haven't really done that with, with young kids. And I'm curious about what the unique challenges would be, I can imagine. But I, I'm, so when I saw that chapter, I thought, oh, okay, this is what I've been waiting for. It's terrific. So, so let's start with, um, do you, did you have some kind of unique situation in terms of employment or any other aspect of your life that made this kind of a leap possible? No, it was a pull off the bandaid. I was tied to a desk every single day. Remote work wasn't even an option. Um, it was, you know, it was a huge decision to, to walk away from that, especially after so many years, you know, the sunk cost fallacy is really niggling at you. You can't walk away now and your peers and your parents and your other friends around you, like, what are you doing? You, you're going to damage the kids. They're never going to be able to socialize. They're never going to be able to go to college. They'll never be able to get a job. Uh, you know, you're walking away from a good salary, all of these kind of things. Um, but what, uh, what? What I did actually to get over all of that, and I urge anybody to do this as well, and I picked that up from uh, Tim Ferriss's book, uh, was to do a fear-setting exercise rather than a goal-setting exercise. And, mm. uh, you know, write down your biggest fears because once you've written down your biggest fears and they're staring you on that piece of paper in front of your eyes, you can start addressing them properly. And my biggest fear was, okay, I'm going to quit my job. We're going to take the kids out of school. We're going to sell everything. We're going to give the keys back to the landlord. We're going to leave a country that we've called home for the last 15 years. And we're going to start traveling. Ah, I'm going to go bankrupt and we're going to end up living under a bridge, surely. Like, you know, that is definitely my, my biggest fear. And so you start trying to unravel, like, what, what steps would you put in place if that actually did come to pass? And when you realize, oh, well, my parents have a home, my wife's parents have a home, our four brothers have homes, the extended family, my goodness, you know, before you know it, there's probably a choice of 50 bedrooms where you could go and sleep and get fed three times a day. So that fear was off the table. And then you can just work down the, down the list. Um, but the, the one thing that I really want to, to get across here is, yeah, people think this is only for those people that have managed to um, you know, retire early or have a big savings account or have got a million dollars in the bank, the people we've met on the road living this exact same kind of lifestyle vary so vastly. And you know, there's certainly not that characteristic. It's just people that are living intentionally and figuring it out as they go. And in fact, it is cheaper to live this kind of long-term travel lifestyle than it is to sit still in one country and be exposed to you know, all of the taxes and all of the bills and everything else that comes with that. All right, well, that opens up a, a big can of worms because the, the tax thing, and, and you know, I, I don't know what kind, of, uh, what kind of disclaimer we have to give or something, but you know, we're not giving tax advice and all that stuff. But... I thought I read that becoming a so-called digital nomad, where you, you don't live in any one location long enough to really be a citizen of that place, and so you're not really subject to any taxes anywhere, that was increasingly difficult to pull off. Now, the, the, as far as I'm aware, most countries, uh, if you live on, in any one country for six months or longer, then you do become exposed to their tax laws. But if you're in and out, if you're there for a month, two, three months, you're just a tourist and uh, you're gone again. But that's not the same for U.S. citizens, right? Because you are taxed by your nationality, I believe. You know, if you're a U.S. citizen, then you're paying tax, whether or not you're in the country or not. Uh, yeah, it's the tax. empire. You know, the empire is <laughs> going to get you. So I you guys got you, your independence. Like, you know, what's going on? Well, w did you renounce your, well, okay, I'm getting way ahead of the game. So okay. you, you embark on this, on this incredible journey, not yeah. exactly knowing where it's going to take you or how long you'll do it or what's waiting for you at the end of it, if anything. So what exactly did happen in terms of um, your travels? Like, where did you go? What ex kinds of experiences you had? Like, um, the, like, like, where did you go for how long? And then mm -hmm. what ended up happening in terms of the kids' education and your employment? Yeah. Okay. So the the way we did it, we were living in Singapore, but we were only renting 
uh, a home there. Uh, property prices were just way too expensive. Uh, but we had purchased a house in Thailand, which was a lot cheaper and uh, currency exchange rates were a lot kinder to us back in those days. So we had, we did have a place that we could start from, which was outside of, you know, Singapore where we were leaving. So we went there first for about six weeks from memory. And we had joined a home swap exchange site. At the time it was called Love Home Swap. It's now been merged with homeexchange.com. And we just listed the property on there. Just let's see what happens here. It was a new concept. In fact, uh, I'd even spoken with De- Debbie Waskow, the, the CEO, and she got the uh, inspiration to start this company after watching the film The Holiday with uh, Cameron Diaz and Kate Winslet. And so we listed the property, and within two weeks, it was crazy. We were getting people approaching us from all over the place, and we're thinking, well, we could probably start crafting an itinerary here around the home swap opportunities and that's just going to change the game completely because we, we're going to drive our accommodation costs to zero, which was going to be always like the, the most expensive part of the trip. You know, you've got to rent a house long term, wherever. So we started approaching other people and plotted a route. We went to, uh, we were in Australia for three months and then we went to New Zealand for three months, and we were home swapping in different parts of each country. And then we went across to um, the US, and we were in between US and Canada for three months. And then we come across to Europe, and then we were in different company uh, countries, <laughs> different countries around Europe for anywhere between ten days to to three weeks, whatever we could get with the, with the home swapping. And uh, yeah, we lived like that for two and a half years straight. And I think we we swapped into different, like 16, 17 different countries. Uh, and goodness knows how many properties. And and how many kids and what ages were they that you have at the time? Four kids. Uh, they were aged eight, six, and two three-year-old twins when we left. And uh, they are currently now 18, 16, and 13-year-old twins. Okay. Okay. Now, let me say in parentheses, I'm skipping way ahead in the story, but I just liked this part. At one point, you said to the kids, of all the places that we've visited, uh, which one did you like the most and would you most like to be able to speak their language? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a great question because I I like, for example, I did something at at, at a friend's recommendation. We do a lot of travel. And one, one time we said to the kids, I want you to look up some place you'd like to go and then make a presentation to the family and then we'll vote and see which one seems the most interesting to, to visit. And I like it pulls them in. But but what you did really, really pulled them in. And they apparently they said French. Yeah. And so can you just I know I've skipped ahead, but yeah, but I, no, I love that part of the story. That that's fine because that's another uh, that was another way that we were finding accommodation uh, because at that point we were house sitting and that's another website trusted house sitters we were using at the time uh, where you just look for people have second houses all over the world and they don't generally all want to be doing the Airbnb thing yeah. but they do want people living in their property and looking after it stewarding it doing the gardening, making sure um, that you're there to collect the post or let in builders or plumbers or electricians, whoever needs to come in and uphold the uh, the property, um, upkeep, excuse me, the property. So we'd been in France for three months over the summer, house-sitting for, uh, for this guy that was based in the UK. And that was the first time we'd been in one location, in one house, for any length of time for two and a half years. And we decided, well, wow, this actually is a nicer pace of life. You know, we're not scrambling to try and find a roof over our heads in the next 10 days. What if we stood still for a year? You know, what, what would that look like? And my wife and I, we both decided if we could gift any ability to our kids, what would it be? And the, the ability to speak another language sure. was top of our list. 
And uh, so that's what we put to the kids. Yeah. What language do you want to learn and what country do you want to live in? Because we will move to that country and we'll live longer term there and you get to learn the language. We'll immerse. Um, you will have to go back into the school system for a little while just to make sure that you can get up to speed on that because that'll be the quickest way to, to make this happen. And yeah, we'd had a great summer in France. So I guess they were kind of uh, bamboozled by the incredible croissants in the morning and uh, the picnics by the lake and the, the wonderful weather and everything else that come with uh, French country living. So that's what they chose. So we then started looking. We kind of knew the area that we wanted to go. So we looked for more house swaps and home sits and we found a few more. And then out of one of those, we ended up making a, a longer term deal. And there was a Montessori style school just in the, 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 the local village there, which they, uh, they all started at. And that's where they started picking up their French and learning their language. Everybody, Tom Woods here with another word on behalf of the Outstanding Monetary Medals, where I have been very happy to have an account because I earn interest on my gold paid in gold. And I'm very happy to be joined today for this extremely brief mini interview with Addison Qualley, who actually works for Monetary Medals. How'd that come about? Uh, and I think you have a job where you actually really believe in what you do. That's correct, Tom. Uh, basically, I am the VP of Relationships here at the company. Um, I've been here since 2013, and I, I basically lead the sales department and help people come on board monetary metals uh, and help handle their accounts. Um, I've always been a, a big fan of freedom. Uh, somehow along the way, uh, was a fan of freedom just from high school. That really kicked up a notch when I started following your show in, in 2013. And um, I was working at a gold company at the time. Um, I came to understand that gold is honest money and a very good thing. And um, when I learned about monetary metals uh, back then, uh, around 2016, it just seemed like something that could really change the world for good. Uh, if you can earn interest on gold and finance in gold, um, that is potentially world changing and you can get gold to come back into the monetary system. So that really excited me. I jumped ship from my old company. I joined monetary metals back then. And, um, you know, one of the exciting ideas we had in our head was at the time, Uber was kind of taken out the New York City taxi cabs and Uber had gone viral. And we thought, you know, if interest on gold, if earning yield on gold could go viral, uh, maybe that could uh, become a legitimate alternative to the dollar. And um, we're, we're excited to be growing a lot uh, since then. Uh, the company's grown by leaps and bounds and um, it's been a very exciting journey. Well, I'm very glad to be able to be a very small part of it. So find out more and join me. Open up your own account with Monetary Metals. Head over to monetary-metals.com slash woods to get more information. That's monetary-metals.com slash woods. Okay, so now I want to I, I get to, by the end of it, where did you wind up in terms of career? And what, how do the kids, you have, there's testimony from one of your kids in the book about what it was like growing up this way. Um, I want to know, like, looking back on, let, let's let's jump to the end of your story. I mean, are you still doing an awful lot of traveling, or are you are you kind of staying put in France at this point? And then what what ended up happening with with uh, what you do for a living? Yeah. So at the moment, we we did stay in France. Uh, we, we kind of we call it our base. But we use this base to to jump off and travel all the time. And we still home swap as well, pretty much. And anytime we're traveling, the first thing we're looking to do is find a home swap so we can, you know, make it way more affordable. Uh, as far as um, employment, I knew that I could never go back to uh, a, a job where I'm going to be sat there five days a week, 10, 11 hours a day. That was just not on the cards. So I had to try and figure out something that I would be location independent. And then yeah. um, just naturally, I don't know how, looking back, uh, I started doing a few interviews and helping um, a friend of mine put together a, a global homeschooling summit. And we did that in 2019 and 2020 from memory. And from that, actually, he launched an educational platform. So off the back of that. So now we had uh, the opportunity of the kids being location independent for their, their schools because they come out of the schools and um, back onto um, online ed tech. 
And I started then falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. I guess I'd started doing that around 2015, 16. And come 2020, I was, I've got to start a podcast about this because, uh, you know, there was just so much knowledge in my head. I just wanted to get it out and share it with as many people as possible. And that's why I started interviewing people. And then that, uh, that started bringing in a few show sponsors. And that's what keeps us, you know, going and going for now. You know, it's not a huge wage by any stretch, but we're, um, it, it's enough for us to live the way that we want to live, uh, especially whilst the kids are young and we can be around the kids all the time, all day and every day. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what's going on. That's, that's, how we've made to, uh, that's how we've managed to make that happen. It's, it's really quite something because the, the description you have at the beginning and, and even at the beginning of this episode of what family life can turn into, where it's uh, this one's being driven to soccer and this one's being driven to gymnastics and this one has this and this one has that. And then they're also in a traditional school and that's taking up an enormous amount of the day. And then they come back loaded with homework and you're just frantically running around and there's no, there's no time to sit and breathe and, and relax mm-hmm. and have leisure. Uh, and, and we just kind of take for granted, well, I guess that's what family life is. Well, I guess it, it's that way if, if, if you make it that way. And, and I, I don't mean to be, I mean, I, we've, we've had very, very hectic family life for some time too, but if you're creative enough, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Is that what you're more or less saying? A hundred percent. And it is that way by design. And I know you've had a lot of people on the show talking about state education system, even higher education and whatever else. Um, yeah, it is set up that way. It's, you know, an attack on the family. It's designed to break down family values. And if you read, um, I point your listeners towards John Taylor Gatto's work, his books, Dumbing Us Down is an incredible one. And uh, Weapons of Mass Instruction is another one. And when you come to realize that this system was captured and set up in such a way that the kids are spending more and more time away from the family unit. They're being brought up by their peers who they're not even, you know, even really socializing with. And the state uh, via one of the, um, you know, the teachers in that classroom that are pushing the state agenda, not curriculum. Uh, And then, like you said, they're getting home from getting off the bus straight into the house to ignore mom and dad or whoever else is home to go upstairs into their room to open their books because they've got a bunch of homework going on. And when, when you see that and you, you can't unsee it because it's so damaging to the family unit, to our, to our relationships, to the kids, you know, psychologically and mentally, it's so unhealthy that as a parent, you're kind of left with no other option than to start thinking about how do we make a difference here? Because I don't think we were born on this planet to live this way, you know, ignoring each other in our own home and all of us marching to the beat of somebody else's drum, whether that's your career or that's the state education system or whether that's some other institution, health institution, whatever. It's, um, it's high time for us as individuals to take on more responsibility. And here's here's the misnomer. People will turn around and say to homeschoolers, are you being an irresponsible parent by not sending your kid to school? Whereas the complete opposite is true. Because now the responsibility is solely on you. Nobody else is in control. You're not outsourcing it to the state and you can't hide behind the excuse of, oh, it must just be a bad teacher. Like, no, it's on you now. And a lot of people are scared of that, Tom. A lot of people aren't ready for that. And it's, it's, um, it's a real shame. But that's what society has become today because I, very much like you, I'm guessing, went through that 15 to 18-year stretch in the uh, prison education gulag. And um, <laughs> it shapes society in a certain way. And I think... We would be in a much better place if a lot more people took a, a much closer look at what's going on and how to extract themselves from that system. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of people think. Now, look, your 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 point is not that everybody should become a, a in effect a nomad for a while or or necessarily travel the world. I mean that that's a great thing, and it's extremely enriching for everybody involved. But the bigger point, I think, is to unplug from a system that is um, that has compromised family life that that makes it hard for you to have those moments where you really connect with with members of your family uh, because you're just overwhelmed with all the all the responsibilities that all these different states in life have imposed on you whether it's the the career the school system itself or or anything else uh, start thinking that way but of course a lot of people come back quite understandably with this is so easy for you to say but um, you know I can't make a living with a with a Bitcoin podcast so I have to figure out something different or or at the very least even if I keep my traditional job, I don't know how I can possibly do the homeschooling thing. And partly because I think some people think that homeschooling means you take what you find in a traditional school and you just put it in your house. And it's not that. Yeah, it's not that at all. And we did make that mistake. And a lot of newbies do make that mistake when you first come to it and you try and set to an agenda, set to a curriculum. But yeah, like like you say, um, I was one of those people that would have read about this kind of uh, lifestyle for other people and would have just poo-pooed it and would have said, yeah, it's fine for them. They're able to do this. They're able to work remotely. Well, they're only able to because they made it happen. You know, that's why the book's called Choose Life. It is a choice. You do have a choice and you can be the author of your own life. You know, you, you don't have to just float along the wind. Um, so the resources that I can point people towards because that's the next step. Finding those people, for me, it was Tim Ferriss and 4-Hour Workweek, but then it was on his blog, I found a family called uh, the Pearson Family. And uh, one, yeah, the father had written um, a blog post about traveling with his three young kids and leaving. He'd left, in, not only left a job, but he'd, he'd left a religion too. And I was like, whoa, like this is, this is crazy stuff. Um, I got to know more. So I started following him and uh, actually emailed him and reached out. And he wrote the foreword in the end because he was so helpful and kind uh, via email. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, then we randomly met when we finally took, you know, we found all the courage to actually do this. And uh, we took off and we were traveling. And we met with them because you suddenly start moving in different circles. And you find a bunch of other world schoolers that are doing this. And you'll meet them in different parts of the world. So we got to meet them. And um, yeah, funny enough, I bumped into him at the, uh, the Bitcoin conference in Miami last year. And that was the first time he'd actually seen a physical copy of the book. So I signed him a copy. But like, once you start making connections, find families like yours, find their blogs, find their Facebook pages, find their Instagrams. Find their website, see what they did, see how they made it work, see how they made it happen, reach out to them, and you will slowly, over a course of a few weeks, maybe even a few months, start building up the confidence and the conviction that there is some way, somehow, that you and your family will be able to pull this off. And even if you go and try it for a month to three months, most people, if you are at the age, anywhere between 30 and 40, you've probably got a half-decent career. You've probably got some brownie points to score some kind of one- to three-month sabbatical or be remote if need be. There's a way that you can test it out, and there's a way that you can uh, start easing yourself into it. And if it's not for you, that's great. That's fine. Just go back to normal family life. But what I want the message for people to be is, you know, if I could have done it, at my point in my career where I thought I was trapped for another 10 to 20 and we managed to get out of it and I've seen hundreds of other families do it as well, then there's no way in the world that you can't either. Hey everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? 
Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. I want to ask you a, a more specific question that is, um, I wouldn't say a selfish question, but it's, it's, it, it is something that I specifically want, what, what, curious about the answer to. So you travel to a number of countries and you know, I would think that a child, and you wouldn't I frankly say this in the book, is going to find history a little bit more interesting when it's staring him right in the face than when it's in a dusty old textbook. Fair enough. But if I take a, I'm not even sure what the age range would be here, but a young child, let's say to a, a guided tour of some Roman ruins or something, I feel like that kid's going to be bored out of his mind and I won't my wife and I won't be able to go or enjoy it because we know that, that there's no way the kid will find this interesting. Did you, you found the opposite? Yes, we did. It doesn't happen straight away. It happens uh, a little bit over time. And it, again, yes, it's going to depend on the age of the kid and how conditioned the kid has been by their, peer, by their peers and the education system itself. Uh, but everything just starts slowing down a little bit when you live this lifestyle. And everything, you know, is... That you're way more connected and you're living way more, um, you're just way more interested in things. And you, it ignites the passion for learning again. It reignites that passion for learning. And the younger the kids are, in fact, uh, I, I, I thought it was the easier because they hadn't been, you know, kind of crushed out of that by the education system. They still had that yearn to learn and sure we would take them to some temples and uh you'd get halfway around them and there'd be an absolute breakdown it's like why are we here again like why do we have to do this like there's there's no getting past that but they generally don't last too long and then you know you're, you're on to the next thing and the, the kids are so intrigued and so interested by talking to other people and listening to other people that you, you, you would find that, yeah, slowly over time, uh, you'd be fine. You'd be, I, I know what you mean. Most people would like, I, there's no way in the world I'm taking my kids on like a, a guided tour. They're going to be bored. They're going to just annoy everybody and they're going to be uh, just on their devices the whole time, not paying attention. It's going to be a waste of money. I would say yes, most likely. If that's your ten to two, ten day to two week holiday, because all they want to do is be on the beach, but because you've changed your life completely, this is like the outing. This is the exciting thing to go and do, and uh, yeah, they'll be way more engaged than you think. And then another thing that might be of more general interest, even to people who don't uh, make any radical lifestyle change, what. Uh, what are some secrets to flying with very young children on long international flights? Right. <laughs> yeah. um, don't fill them with sugar. That, that's one of the main things you, you okay. don't want to do because they're never going to sit down or sit still. So it's like when you see people get on there with, uh, with bags of sweets just to keep the kids quiet, you're like, guys, that's not going to keep the kids quiet. No way. No way in hell. But uh, you know, on the long haul ones, we find them to be the easier. Because generally, there's a, a little television in the back of the seat and the kids are playing games on there the whole time or they're watching movies. And um, before they know it, it's time for landing and they're, they're annoyed that they fell asleep halfway through a movie. Uh, the shorter flights, I think, just like the hour and a half to two hour flights, they're a little bit more challenging because th there's nothing, nothing to do. So that's when we would take the sticker books and whatever else, uh, like coloring books, um, just something really light and really simple that they could just sit down and get into. Uh, and you find as well that most people, this is the biggest fear that most people have when they're traveling with the young kids, that you're going to be annoying everybody else on the plane, 
right? You're, you're projecting that onto yourself. Uh, but generally, most people are really fine that they don't mind if the kid's uh, crying because their ears are hurting. You know, everybody's been through it before. Um, but yeah, I would say um, get over that fear. Um, go for it. If, uh, if anybody's, don't let, don't let traveling with kids put you off traveling because for them, it's one great big wild adventure. Uh, it's just about keeping them as calm as possible rather than just letting them scream around the airport going crazy. Well, we've got this theory. Haven't tested it out because my youngest is now 10. So, uh, but I, you know, there'll be grandkids someday and, you know, you never know what, what, uh, life can bring, but um, I've thought about the possibility of you, you have a bunch of things packed that are entertaining to the child and you, you, you bring one out and when the child becomes fussy with that, you see if you can improve the behavior, but if you can't, you bring out another one and that will keep them quiet for a little while longer and see how long that entertains them just so that you can get a little bit of peace and, and quiet and calm for yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know the other passengers aren't going to be that upset because they've all been there. And, and let me tell you, for all you childless people, when there is a child making noise on a plane, there's almost nothing the parents can do. It's not that they're being bad parents, or if only you were in charge, you'd figure something out. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, this is going to be serve you very well to know this. There's nothing the parents can do when the child is very upset. But I do think that this could hold off that time. Uh, the, yeah. the gradually dripping out of the of the different goodie bags that are in that carry-on. One thing we did have them do uh, was it, it was a great thing actually was to write write letters or draw pictures and color in pictures to give to the stewardess to give to the the pilots, and uh, they loved doing that. It's like okay, let's just make a little picture for the pilot. You know, we can draw this, or we'd have like a printed some printed out pictures of planes, and you color it in, and then you write a letter, and you just put how old you are and your, uh, and uh, what seat you're in and thank you for keeping us safe and flying us to and then let's name the country and blah 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 so that would take some time and on occasion at least two or three times um, they were invited up into the cockpit after landing to go and meet the pilots and uh, and the captain and, and to say thank you for the uh, the nice drawing and whatever else and they got to sit in the seats and wear the hats so uh, yeah once um once you're doing things like that and just think, just slightly, just thinking slightly differently rather than let's get on a plane, let's get this over and done with and get off as soon as possible and let's just, fingers crossed, they don't. And the worst, don't, don't fill them with drugs, please, God, no. Don't, don't anybody do that. Like um, there are some over-the-counter drugs that are like, you know, this will make your kids sleepy on the flight. Um, just please, nobody do that. <laughs> Fair enough. So you have uh, an 18-year-old now. You mm-hmm. said, um, what's, what's next? What do you think is next for your kids? And how do you think that's different from where they, like, do you think, in other words, do you think they're going to live a more conventional lifestyle than, than you? Or do you feel like now they've, they've, you know, gotten a taste of it. Maybe they couldn't imagine having that conventional lifestyle either. Well, my, my 18 year old, after she, uh, after we started living in France and she, um, was trying out the the school uh she opted to stay in whereas the other three opted to come back out and um so her french is almost native it's in it's incredible but uh this last year she was i'm i'm done with academia i'm going to take a year off and um she planned a whole trip with her two friends and they Flew out to Bangkok, and then from there they were off to Cambodia and Vietnam and uh, a few other countries around there. And then she volunteered for a month at a school in Chiang Rai, just outside of Chiang Rai in Thailand, where she was teaching kids English. So it seems she has the travel bug, bug but wants to you know travel and um, interact with uh, each country that she goes to. And she had a great time teaching the kids. Uh, she's actually now decided she will go and study international relations in um, in university in London. Uh, and it looks as though us as a family are probably going to move on from France and, and perhaps set up a, another base elsewhere. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's always it's always fun to know that um, always 
excuse me, fun to think about like that question, like what, what are they going to do? Are they going to be location independent for the rest of their lives? Are they going to figure something out to work remotely? And, uh, or are they going to end up in an office job? And I really, I couldn't tell you. I mean, each personality, as you would know, is completely yep. unique. Uh, goodness knows what the world's going to look like in five to seven years' time. Um, so I just, I am happy. Well, it, it, here's a great point. When they went off for their trip, the other two parents were in bits when their kids were leaving. Like, you know, oh my God, when, what if we never see, like, crying? Whereas, whereas our daughter was saying to my wife and I, why haven't you cried about the fact that I'm leaving to go on it? Because we know you're going to nail it. You're ready. You've got every, you've got all of the experiences behind you. Go and have an amazing time. We'll be here when you get back. And uh, yeah, that's, that's just, I think, uh, an amazing place for a parent to be, knowing that uh, you, you've, you've set them up with so many great life skills and experiences that they're going to be just fine. Well, if you're intrigued or even intrigued by just a sliver of Daniel's story, you will find all the how-tos and, and tips and links and resources and the whole story in his book, Choose Life, The Tools, Tricks, and Hacks of Long-Term Family Travelers, World Schoolers, and Digital Nomads. I'll link to it in the description of the video and also at tomwoods.com slash 2470. Uh, Daniel, I love the story. I couldn't help doing an episode on it. I don't usually do episodes on one person's individual situation because then it's hard for me to interact because because you have all the knowledge and, and I don't. And it's kind of an imbalance for the interviewer. But this was just too good a story to pass up. And I'm I'm so glad you wrote the book. And, and I love the title, Choose Life, because um, – I think sometimes we get, we're in a grind and we think the grind is life, you know, and you even mentioned mm -hmm. this in the book, the expression, that's life, but who wants yep. that to be life? You know, maybe, maybe what you did is life, you know, so, so exactly. in your own way, uh, everybody listening, it doesn't have to be to do exactly what Daniel did, but in your own way, choose life. So Daniel, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Appreciate it. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.